So Karen, thank you so much for coming. This is your second appearance on our Zoom Talks. Um, for anyone who doesn't know Karen Gowen, she's a Mahjong enthusiast, and she's the author of Searching for Bubby Fisher, The Path to Mahjong Wisdom. Um, Karen was introduced to Mahjong in 2003 and was immediately drawn to the intellectual stimulation of the game as well as the social aspect of it. As she sought to improve her game, she discovered there was very little written about the fundamentals and the strategy of Mahjong. So she set out to write the book, which is half memoir and half instructional, and came out with the book in 2014, Searching for Bubby Fisher. She's a frequent lecturer and teacher of the Mahjong game. She also has her own blog, which we've put a link to in our chat, where she talks about Mahjong strategy. Tonight, we're glad to have Karen back to speak to us about Mahjong strategy and how to up your game. So thank you, Karen, for coming again. It's lovely to be back with you guys. Thanks for having me. Okay, so do you want to start with questions or do you want to start how you, you know, in your outline that you sent to us? Um, give me a prompt. I didn't memorize the outline. <laughs> Tell me what, what's the first topic. So the first question a lot of people ask is what is the most important thing a Mahjong player can do to be prepared? Well, I think we all know that the very most important thing is that you need to know the card. You know, every year the card comes out and it's actually a great level playing field because in the beginning of the year, no one knows the card. Some of us pick it up within a week. Some of us, it takes a month or two. I think with the advent of all these wonderful online versions, I think we're all learning it a lot faster because we can play against bots or we can play, you know, as much as we want to. And so we get up to speed quicker. But it's absolutely essential that you know the card, that you know every section of the card, that you know how the hands interrelate. Um, I've probably, in the previous lecture, I probably mentioned players that are afraid of certain sections of the card. You know, there's people who say, I never play singles and pairs, or I never play quints, or when it's three suits, it confuses me. Um, you kind of have to get over those mental blocks because we're talking about upping your game. And the whole point of upping your game is challenging yourself, taking more chances, and the whole purpose of this game is to find the right hand. And if you don't have access to every hand on the card, you're limiting yourself way too much. So by all means, learn the card. That's the number one way to improve. Is so to it's, interesting. it's interesting. You mentioned it a little bit in our first talk, and that's why we were thrilled to have you back for this. You say in your book that a lot of the game is random. It can't be controlled. It's luck, it's fate, it's happenstance. So your estimate is it's about 70% of the game is that aspect. Yeah, totally that, luck. What you were talking about, about being prepared, you're saying it's about 30% that we can control. Mm -hmm. So I love your, your catchphrase that luck favors the prepared mind. Right. That's just such a great way to say it. It's a fortune cookie. <laughs> it's straight out of a fortune cookie. That's and Right, and the whole point is, yes, we can't control the order. We can't control when we get the jokers. We'd love to have three jokers during the Charleston. That would be awesome. But sometimes you don't have to get the jokers till the second wall or even the very last pick. You know, you, you can't control when you get tiles and you can't control what you're past in the Charleston. There's so many things out of your control. The things you can control are knowing the card and thinking mentally, preparing yourself for eventualities. Um, thinking about what would I do if I got another flower? What would I do if I had a pair of these? What should be my backup hand? Which is a really essential thing. I've been talking, I've done a couple lectures this week. And one of them I talked about having a backup hand and I talked to a woman who never switches her hand. She says, once she gets her hand, when she picks it in the Charleston, that's it. And she doesn't win that much because she never changes her hand. You have to be willing to open your mind to the new tiles that come in. You have to take chances. So, so knowing the card, go ahead. In regards to that, I feel like, and this, when I say experienced, I don't mean length of time. I just think experienced players, depending on how long they've been focusing on the card, I find that some newer players will um, be so hesitant. They hear that a flower is a good tile or that a, that a soap's a good tile and they won't throw it. So it's not that you have a backup hand, all of their hands, all their tiles are a backup hand. So how do you get, like they can't pick a hand. So how do you distinguish between, like how do you advise new players 
to get rid of tiles, that they might be good tiles, but that they're not part of them. Uh, well, it all starts with the Charleston, as you know. And what I, we, we've all had kids that, I mean, even, even those of us that are grandparents now, um, our grandchildren watch Sesame Street. We all know Sesame Street. Every time I play the Charleston, I think of that game. One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> and every time I look at my tiles in the Charleston, I think, well, it looks like I've got mostly evens, or I've got mostly odds, or I've got mostly 369, or I've got the lower end of the number line, or the higher end. Or look, I've got all bams and a green dragon. This is awesome. Whatever it is, look for the patterns. And, you know, if you've got this year, a two and a seven doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There have been years where it did make sense, but you, you have to know the card a little bit before you look at the at, at your tiles for the Charleston, just to know what kind of things you're going to be going for. Um, I think later on today, we're going to be doing some Charleston's, right? For examples. Mm -hmm. So that, that'll be an opportunity for you to, for me to show those of you, if anybody's on the newer end of the, of the, of the Mahjong world, how to make up your mind a little more quickly during the Charleston and, you know, what doesn't belong? What am I going to get rid of? Same with when you're playing. Um, you may be committing yourself to a section of the card pretty early. Like, it looks like I've got all even, so I'm going to stick to that section of the card. Maybe it'll be like numbers because I'm sort of collecting twos and fours. But, you know, something like that. So that if you picked up a nine when you're playing the evens and the like numbers, you know you can get rid of that nine. You know, you have to have some self-editing. You have to have some sense that some of these tiles are expendable. And it's so funny that you said that about the soaps, because everybody here knows, everybody who's ever read my book knows, I love soaps. I'm a sucker for soaps. But if I get them in the trust and I don't, and I don't need them, I still won't pass them. I will wait, and they'll be the first thing I discard. So yeah, even if you know that it's a valuable tile, that doesn't mean you have to keep it for the whole game. Get rid of it early before anybody else can call for it, because they're not ready for it. Well, we have questions, I mean, Dara, you can see in the chat, there's a bunch of questions and people have asked, oh, wow. how, how do you do strategy when we're alone? You know, how, what is the strategy for learning the card? Um, oh, I don't even, I don't see that. On the... Yeah, I don't see any comments yet. Yeah, no, there's a bunch of chat, so. Oh, maybe it went to just you. Ah. Um, it says, I want to try to force hands like Michelle Frizzell does on her video with the random index cards. Is there anything online alone you could do? Um, is there a word? I don't know what that means. I'm sorry. Yeah, Michelle Frizzell does. Um, she plays four racks at a time and passes okay. to the other rack and, and tries to force a certain hand on the card, you know, and it's just a way to learn the card. That's the way she does it. Okay, well, in my book, I talk about, I, I don't, I try not to do anything that's Michelle's, and Michelle, I hope, doesn't do right. anything that's mine. Right. In my book, I talk about something called Charleston Solitaire, where I tell people to set up all four racks, but I don't tell them to force a hand. I say, play each rack as if you're trying to maximize its potential, and you're just playing a normal Charleston with each of the four hands, and they'll just sort of naturally evolve into four separate hands. You know, you're getting rid of all the odds from this one and this, the, the hand to your right, you know, you're, you're, you're literally getting up and moving over to each of the four racks. And you'll see over time that hands evolve. Um, some of them will have more of the three, six, nine. Some of them will have more of the even numbers. Some of them will have more of the winds and dragons because of the way that the tiles get passed. But this is different than Michelle's, I think, because what I'm saying is you're learning four different hands because you're not trying to maximize any one of them. You're trying to make the best out of each individual rack, all four simultaneously. So I honestly think that's a really good way to learn because you're learning four different hands all at the same time. We've actually had people post in our community of them playing by themselves. And like you said, they're at one rack and then they move to the next rack. Yeah, exactly. If you've got that kind of time, it's a great mental exercise. It probably takes about 40 minutes to play a whole game that way. Wow. But it's fascinating because you'll think at the beginning of the Charleston that this is the hand that's going to win because it's got more jokers or whatever. And during the game, so many things come up and change that the hand that you would have thought would win doesn't always win. That's why I think betting is a weird strategy, too, because you don't know at the end of the Charleston who's really got the best hand. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's obvious, but not always. So I think, I mean, 
the question was, is there anything online for Michelle? But I don't think, I mean, Dara, unless you say, unless you play I mean, she, box, is, she, she is a solitaire chart that you could print out. Right. To tell you how to do it. Right. And that's free to just print out. I mean, I think the best thing also for, is to play against the bots in any yes. of the and then, online And then also, um, we had actually, uh, Greg had talked about it yesterday. Um, it's the um, American, and we're not affiliated with anything, we don't, you know, but um, we interviewed the maker of the American Mahjong Practice app, and it's on Apple and Google, and it's either $2.99 or $1.99, and you get the card for the year, and it tells you how far you are away from each hand. So as you're playing, you could look at it and you could be like, well, I normally play this hand, but I'm gonna challenge myself even though I'm this many tiles away from this hand and it walks you through. And wow. the, bots, the bots never win and you must, you don't need Wi-Fi. So those are two really nice pluses about it. I, that's an amazing thing. I, I can't even imagine it telling you how close you are. That's really cool. But, but strategy wise, you're, you, you could throw anything, the bots won't win. So it's not really teaching you an actual game, but it's a great lesson to learn the to card. To learn the card. Wonderful. Right, and there's a couple of other, I, I forget which app it is, but one of the Mahjong apps has little drills, not just games. I'm okay. forgetting which one. One of them has like drills. If anyone knows, which. type it in the comments. <laughs> yeah, this one's the American um, practice app, right? Yeah. Okay. Are you seeing, Donna, I'm sorry, are you seeing the text that I texted? Yeah. Okay. So, oh, so Greg wrote Mai Zhang is the one with tutorials. And um, Harold, I think is Peggy, wrote Mai Zhang Practice Change the app where you can have the bots win. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Thank you. And um, okay. It is in the chat. It, um, Stacy, it's like two yeah. above your, your screen. I was going to say, this is what it looks like. But wow. yeah. And if you look on the bottom, it shows you how many tiles away. She's eight tiles away from Tubes Anyone Suit. She, you know. Mm -hmm. And it'll keep track of how many wins you've had in that category. Right. That's incredible. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Well, so, I never and actually, if you search on um, Mahjong Community, we have an interview with the creator of the app. And it was something he thought he was just going to create to have fun playing to improve his game. And it turns out that he wound up taking it to Apple. So I'm sorry, we got sidetracked. So oh no, I think it's fascinating. I mean, I'm much more of a visceral player. Like I'll go with my hunches. I won't sit there and really say I've got seven of this and five of that. I don't sit there and count. I just sort of go with my gut. But it is interesting that they will do that for you statistically. I I didn't even know yeah. such a thing existed. So he's a statistician, right? He's a mathematician, or he's a yeah. That's he loved that part of it. He didn't really play in the beginning. Um, I also think it, it, it also is different playing online versus playing in person with friends because Darren and I have spoken. We have one or two friends that always play the same hand. So you play yes. differently when you know that she's going to play consecutive or, you know, one, three, five, you know, yep. so it, it's just that also factors into what you're going to play, you know. So you also talk about oomph. <laughs> <laughs> don't, be, don't be intimidated by one section or type of hand. Right. That's what yeah. I was saying just now, that the yeah. players that are trying, if you're really trying to up your game, if you're really trying to be a better player and win more often, you can't exclude anything. Mm -hmm. You've got to try things. You've got to go for long shots sometimes. I mean, this is me. I'm, I definitely play long shots. I, I, I recommend it. I think it's more fun. It's more exciting. If you want to play you know, a nice social game and you want something where you don't have to think and you always know it's the consecutive run hand or it's always like numbers, that's fine. But the whole point of tonight's lecture was upping your game and therefore putting a little oomph in it. Mm -hmm. So you got to challenge yourself a little bit, get out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to like tips on how to pick a hand, if you're dealt two jokers do, or three joker, do you automatically look in the quint section? No. Dara does. No. Certain, like, well, <laughs> Sheila does. <laughs> so so what, are, what are ways that you pick your hand? It depends on what the other tiles are. I wouldn't automatically go to Quince. I mean, if I had something that was just so obvious, like that third consecutive run hand, where it's three, three, four, four, you know, two of one suit and two of the other suit, and it's just so easy. And you see it right there in front of you. You've got the six, seven, eight, nine staring you in the face. Why would I play Quince when I've got it right there? And I've got the jokers, so I'll just use them. 
it really depends on what else I've got. If I've got this year, I guess it's what's flowers, dragons, and, and number. Mm -hmm. If I have some flowers and I have some dragons and I have two or three of a number, yeah, I would go for that quint hand, but I wouldn't necessarily gravitate to quints just because I have the jokers. It really depends. And if you're close to singles and pairs and you have jokers, do you stick with the singles and pairs? Like how many jokers that you're picking or what? Do you finally just say, all right, I'm throwing these or I'm switching to a matching corresponding hand in another section? Um, depends how early it is. Obviously, until you expose, you're fine doing singles and pairs. If I really was like 11 tiles in with one joker, I would probably wait on calling for anything and just see if I still had a shot at that singles and pairs. And if it didn't turn out after about four or five picks, then I might say, okay, I give up. I'm going to go for an easier hand to attain. But in the very beginning, you know, why not go for it? It's and a I challenge. Feel, I feel that this year's hand, a lot of people find it's not flexible. Maybe once you expose, certain hands aren't flexible, but I feel until you expose, every singles and pairs corresponds to another hand. Yes. And there's so many hands, we, we were counting, there are three sets of hands that only have two tiles different. So and, and one's concealed and one's open. So it's yeah. like Flower News 2020, yeah. Flower and then it, the only difference if you're doing soaps is the two two or the soap soap. So it makes it, you know, if you realize you're concealed versus exposed, you have two choices to go. So how, what are your tips on figuring out your backup hands that can be switched? Oh, let's see. The number one thing about having the backup hand for me is because of exposures. I never want to be in a position where I've exposed something and therefore I'm tied down to it and my hand goes dead and there's nothing to switch to. And there's very few, there's very few hands here where one exposure, it, that one exposure is a one-time thing. It's only appears once on the card. Most of them are flexible enough that you can go with that. So that's part of my backup hand strategy is to figure out something where, okay, where are there things that go together when I make an exposure? Um, pairs are also essential. Um, that's again, speaking to the backup hands. If I don't have the pair, I definitely make sure that I've got a backup hand for whatever it is that I'm playing. Because if the, if the pair falls through, like say I'm going for the number one uh, hand in the even section and three of the fours come out and I'm stuck. I'm never going to make that pair of fours. I have to figure out something else that I can switch to. So mm -hmm. it's always important to have plan B. That's true. So what are some suggestions how someone can play more aggressively? Do you think uh, that's, our, that's with the Charleston? Do you think? A little with the Charleston, um, mostly with calling for things. I am not timid about making that first exposure. I think that's a mistake that a lot of people make is they say, oh, I don't want to put a joker out there because if I put a joker out there, somebody will get that joker. You have just as good a chance as anyone else of getting it. And if you don't use the joker for the exposure, you're going to need to use the joker later to complete the set anyway, unless we're talking about a three of a kind. You might let the first one go if you're just waiting for a pump. If you've got two of something and you're waiting for the third, um, I still would probably expose it, but that's me. Again, I would make sure that it's an exposure that's flexible enough mm -hmm. that it can swing to my backup hand. Um, people have talked about, would you expose winds? Because winds tie you down. I mean, most of the winds this year are pretty flexible. Like if you do north, if you do north, obviously you're going to need south, but nobody's going to know exactly which of the hands you're playing. Right. Um, the thing I like this year, this this top north, um, the top winds hand doesn't have a pair anymore. It used to be, you know, four north, four east, four west, two south. And you really get stuck if somebody throws, you know, you're stuck without the south. Having it all be something that you can use jokers for makes it a really easy hand to make if people are passing you the jokers. I mean, if they're passing you the winds during the Charleston, it's a really easy hand to make. This is a good question from Michelle. What if you don't have any flowers after the Charleston, but you have many of the other tiles for the hand that requires a pair of flowers? Do you rule out the flower hand in that case or hope you get a pair of flowers at some point? 
Well, let's talk about a specific example. Are we going to talk about like, uh, I guess all the like numbers hands need flowers. Um, what's an example of a hand where, is there something where it's flexible enough that you could do a backup hand that didn't have flowers? Well, the like numbers, I mean, you need flowers. They all need flowers. Right, they right all I know, that's what I'm flowers. saying. What's her, right. What is her example of a hand that she wanted, but she can't go for it without flowers? Uh, I don't think she, she didn't say a hand specifically, but I think in general. She well, thinking, that's why I'm trying to say if we can find a specific, like I'm looking in the 369 section. Um, for or, instance, if yeah, you, Rachel said, how about 2468? So say you have most of the other tiles, but you have no flowers. But in the 2468, you can, you can. It's four of them, so you can use jokers. Right. So mm -hmm. that makes it a little easier. I think the harder thing with flowers, honestly, is the pair. Yeah. And if you're going for the five, that's a whole other story. But yeah, the pair is definitely harder to attain. Um, I would definitely, if I didn't have a, any flowers by the end of the Charleston, I'd have to be flexible and look for a second hand that doesn't require them, but keep my mind open. So like I was saying, if you were in the 369 section, um, that fifth hand down with flowers and then Kongs of 369, if you look, um, the top hand, it's 3669. Again, it's the Kong of 69. So that's sort of, mm -hmm. sort of a backup. And if the flowers, I would still hold under the threes, hoping that maybe it would still come in. But yeah, flowers are really, there, there's certain tiles that you can't force. You can try, but you really can't force. And a pair is really hard to create out of thin air. And then Michelle had said about the 2020 hands. So if you have no flowers, I think it'd be very difficult, depending yeah, on- I guess the know. only ones are the closed one. Right. It's the only one without any. Right. Otherwise, I mean, it depends what you have. You could switch to like numbers with twos if you had enough two. It just depends on how many two, you know, twos you have. I actually just played that. Yeah. I had a whole lot of twos and I only had one soap and the other soap just wasn't coming. So I said, ah, oh, the heck with it. And I switched it to the uh, like numbers one. It was still with the five flowers. Right. But I said, the soap isn't coming. So I went from lots of, you know, the 2020 to the like number twos. Right. Because sometimes you have to do that. You talked about coaxing out discards. <laughs> what do you mean when you say that? Uh, that's kind of, it's easier, I think, in a social game than it is online because you know, I, I don't know. I play against bots. I don't really play against people. So I don't know how intuitive and how much people are really noticing when they play online against each other. But when I'm in a social game in person, um, my, my perfect example was I was playing that hand at the North-South where there was a pair of Souths. This is the old hand. And I needed that pair of Souths and I only had one. And the way that I got her to throw or somebody, anybody to throw the South was I had enough jokers to cover. So I threw out a North. So she thought, oh, so Souths are safe. So if you can do a trick like that to coax out somebody throwing something that you need because you've got enough jokers to cover for it, that's what that would be. It's, it's, it's a finesse kind of move. You're, <laughs> you're sort of tricking them. But again, I don't know that a bot is going to know what the heck I'm doing. It's more of a, like I said, it's more of a personal thing in person. Is that also about bluffing? You talk about bluffing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I, I play a lot of quint hands with my friends anyway. I mean, all this stuff, bluffing against a, bluffing against a um, bot makes no sense. I mean, you just, bluffing is basically trying something that you have no hope in the world of making. Because one of Bubby's other things besides saying luck favors the uh, prepared mind is if you can't win, don't lose. So a wall game, especially I know on real Mahjong, I get 10 points for a wall game. Same with the tournament, you get 10 points for a wall game. So wall games in my world are pretty good. It's better than losing. So if you can't win, don't lose means sometimes bluff a little bit and put everybody else on defense. If you put something out there that you don't have a hope in hell of making, but it will put everybody else back on their heels and they'll think, oh, she's so close. I've got to throw, throw away my hand to protect. Like I'm trying to defend, I don't want to give her the tiles she needs, so they'll break up their hands. Again, a lot of what I talk about is human games, not computer games. I don't know how much of it translates. I mean, when you play against your friends online, 
do you feel like you're st still doing the same amount of strategy that you were doing in person? No, it's definitely no. not. Yeah, it's a little okay. more detached. Not if I don't know who I'm playing. If I'm playing actual the same group, then mm -hmm. I know which hands they favor and I know which hands to expect them. You know, there's certain friends that I, well, she doesn't play online, but if she did, I wouldn't throw her a wind or something like that. But if you're right, playing with random players or people that you haven't really played, you wouldn't know. But yeah. do you think our friend that you play with, with her and her mom, do you think that friend plays the same online? As in um, I, th I think so, because she's, um, she's pretty um, risky, like a risk taker in, pers in person. So I think she does the same online. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but then again, that's my whole, I mean, not that I have any psychology major background, but that's my whole <laughs> separate conversation of, I feel a lot of someone's personality can be seen by the way they play. Oh, I think so. And what hands they choose and whether they stay in one section or whether they challenge themselves or if they, you know, how upset they are if they don't win that one day. You know, to me, I think that's such a tell on people, how, how they live outside of Mahajan as well. Mm -hmm. Can I just say something about that? I was just today, um, one of the first hands I played, I needed a five dot, it didn't happen. For the rest of the time I was playing, every time I saw a five dot, I was like, oh, <laughs> for different hands, completely different rounds. I was like, right. oh, the five dot. It's like the one that got away. Sometimes I can't let it go. So that, like you said, it tells you something about my personality that I was like, I can't let that five dot out of my mind, even though just a game, let it go. Move so on. that's interesting. <laughs> Nicole was saying how um, with her group, she feels the strategy works the four that you were saying, but with bots, it's totally different. Uh -huh. And then Nicole was just saying that she plays differently on realmajan.com because there's no penalty for throwing. So that is that, true. Yeah. 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 So that's why, like, on our tournament, if um, real mahjong doesn't have, um, you can be called dead if you try to make an incorrect exposure. But if you're just not able to win because the tiles are down, they won't call you dead. That's so, weird. I mean, that's there's limitations of computers. That's the yeah. bottom line. So on the on the um, tournament that we run, if you're in a chat and they say, "Hey, you're dead," if there is a wall game, you don't get the ten points because we okay. just had to adjust for that. So kind of in that line of uh, reasoning, how do you help people improve their um, deep, the defensive play? Well, going back to the learn the card thing, it's essential. You need to know not only what you're playing, but what other people are playing. And by knowing the card well, you have the opportunity. You're, you're, it frees up your mind and your resources to be looking at everyone else's play and not just focusing on yourself. If you're still trying to figure out what hand you're doing and what it looks like, then you can't pay attention to what else is going on at the table, so you couldn't possibly play defense. But if you know in your mind, I'm looking for odd tiles, I'm looking for tiles on the bottom end of the number line, you know, you're, you're savvy enough that you're already aware, you can rule out a lot of things, you can put your attention to other things, including what other people are exposing, what other people are discarding, um, there is that problem where you think a tile is safe to discard and it isn't. That's always a problem. That drives me crazy when, you know, she threw a six bam, she threw a six bam, so you throw a six bam and then the person calls for it. Right. And you're like, why didn't you do that before? I could have gotten a joker. But they're like, well, you know, those are the kinds of things that you can't control for, but at least you were aware enough to, it, it was a reasonable assumption. But by being aware, you know, by paying attention, you would do that. Um, but yes, defense, absolutely. Best preparation for defense is knowing the card. So it frees you up to do other things. Do you think yeah. there's any benefits actually reading the card? I mean, when it first comes out, there are girls in our group that at night go to bed and read the card. Well, you can't just look at it. You have to right. think about it. You have to think about, I always talk about identifying the key patterns, like the singles and not the singles and pairs, the uh, consecutive run hands. You know, that first hand, the one, two, three, four, five, has a pattern to it. Some years it's a bell curve with the threes are the biggest number. Sometimes it's Insane. a step ladder and the five is the highest. It goes one, two, three, four, five, going up a ladder. So you need to understand those patterns. You need to understand, you know, where are the hands that have a lot of pairs in them? You can't just look at each one. I mean, maybe that's just me. Maybe I learn better with patterns. Maybe some people just have to go strictly by memorization. 
But I do think knowing the patterns, the underlying patterns, for me anyway, that's what helps me. I could be wrong. You, you may learn a totally different way. So, so another thing, when, oh, when you first, every year, you do a great card review. Thank so you. this year we shared it on Mahjong Community. And mm -hmm. um, you were saying an exposure of any three flowers, dragons, north or south are illegal. So just seeing that on someone's hand, you automatically know they're dead. Right, you can call their hand dead. Yes. And then, so are there other things that you found different about this card? Well, every card's different, obviously. This year we've got the five flowers, which always makes things interesting. Um, what else did I see? I loved seeing the multiplication hands. I really was sad. I, I really miss <laughs> the flowers, two numbers, and dragons. That's yeah. just the old reliable. We don't have How it. How many times this year have you been dealt on? a flower, the same number in the matching dragon. I, I get the, I mean, not a ton of it, but, and then I laugh because I either have to get rid of one or the other because it's not needed yet. Well, I would still hold on to both because they're both really essential. I'd still keep my flowers and my dragons until I really know what hand I'm going for, just because. Yeah, no, I'll hold it until it's, until it's getting unsafe to throw it. <laughs> exactly. So, do you recommend a different strategy for when you're entering a tournament versus when we get back to our regular weekly play? Um, yeah, I personally, the, we all know that in, with your friends, obviously the first person to win, you, you can't mosh second. That's another boobyism, you can't mosh second. But in a tournament, it's absolutely essential that you go as quickly as you can in terms of go for the easy hand, go for the win. I will challenge myself to do the crazy stuff when I'm playing with my friends. But when I'm at a tournament, I'm like, you know what? I got to rack up the points. And in a tournament, what you're finding is on average, at least in the tournaments I've been in, it's about 60 points around gets you to the, gets you to the top places. So that means winning two hands every round or one big hand every round in a couple wall games. But a lot of that means just focus on the win. Don't do anything fancy. Just go for the easy wins. And I found that people were doing a lot less of the, uh, I don't know how many people know basketball, but uh, Bob Cousy was a famous Celtic who used to call all the little tricks and twirls and stuff. He called that French pastry. Mm -hmm. So you don't do the French pastry as much in a tournament. You go straight for the win. So like the consecutive numbers, the, um, the two, three, four, five kind of hand, you just go for the easy win. So that's a little bit of a different strategy, I think, in a tournament than in a. Uh, than so in now, a if you just tip your hand when someone sees you at the table, they're going to know you're sticking to the easier hands. <laughs> well, no, no, no. But the other thing is, if my tiles tell me to go for something crazy, I'll do it. So I mean, this is something you shared on our first Zoom talk, which uh -huh. um, quickly, and then I think we're ready to go to the um, your screen. Mm -hmm. But you do something very interesting when you play in tournaments. You are extremely methodical at, after the game. Can you share that quickly, what you do? Oh, keep, keeping statistics. Yeah. Yes, I'm a nerd. I, uh, no, didn't I say write that. <laughs> what? I didn't say that. I just said Oh, it's true. I'm, I'm proud of it. I was, I was a math person. I used to do a lot of math. Um, what I do is I write down before, you know, as each hand is dealt out, how many flowers, how many jokers did I start with? What did I think I was playing at the end of the Charleston? I write all that down, then I play. At the end of each game, I write down what was the winning hand, how many flowers and jokers did it have, how many flowers and jokers did I end up with, and what hand did I end up playing. So the idea would be, oh, I also do um, whether they picked it or it was thrown. I mean, whether, yeah, whether it was self-pick or whether it was thrown. So what I found, some of the things that I found were that uh, about 50% of the time, I would change my hand from what I thought it was at the end of the Charleston. So even though if you think you know what you're playing, like even the section of the card that I thought I was playing, I thought I was playing Quince and I ended up playing the 2000 hand or, you know, things just change based on how the game goes. Half the time my hand was totally different than what I thought it was when I started. Um, I found, you know, by averaging over 48 hands that yeah, you are dealt about on average, I think it was two thirds of a joker and two thirds of a flower. I could go back over the statistics, but it really did net out that you got the average number of jokers and flowers every hand. That's just how it is. And people, um, people definitely won with jokers in their hands still. That yeah. made a difference.
statistics um, wise, we thought it was interesting when we were um, had a vendor table at one of Gladys' tournaments. She had announced the statistics that at, um, East was more likely to win. The East player had the extra tile was more likely to win. That makes sense, but remember that's you know that goes around the table all four times. Yeah, everybody has a chance. Yeah. So everybody has that one and four chance. Yeah. So having that extra tile in the beginning, beginning could be helpful. Um, what I think in tournaments, the person that's sitting in the East chair in a real tournament, not necessarily online, but in a real tournament, and the tournaments I run, which some of the ladies have gone to, um, I put my most experienced players at East. And so they do actually have an advantage and they do tend to win, the people that sit in the East chair, right. because they're more experienced players. That's just how it is. So that's if separate. All, so if all of you that are here, bear with us, because this technology we're just kind of working on, but now we're gonna share the screen. Donna's gonna share, let um, Karen share her screen. And we're gonna go to a real Mahjong game and just try. have actual game, you know, as if, you know, Karen's joining you and, and kind of helping you guide you and, and give you advice on your picks. I am trying to figure out where I am here. Okay. Oh, I know it always disappears. So while, I, so Kathleen said also- Did this work? Yeah, yeah. In the there East. you go. There's me. Yeah, if you put your most experienced players in the East chair, and then of course I just lost the um, chat. <laughs> oh, I was saying, like, Gloria knows. Gloria's been to my tournaments and I've made her be East. Oh, no, Kathleen, <laughs> Kathleen was commenting on your, um, Kathleen was commenting on your comment. So I just lost. Okay. She said, it, Kathleen said, if you put your most experienced players in East chair, oh, <laughs> then your most experienced that's players don't have to face off against true. each other. <laughs> that is, that is also true. Right. That is very true. Uh, Greg doesn't know this, but I went to an event that Greg had and Barney and I agreed not to sit at the same table the whole time so that we <laughs> wouldn't oppose each other. So we both ended up winning because we didn't go against each other. Oh, is that funny? It's true. Yep. Now Greg knows the secret. Don't yep. play against Barney. <laughs> <laughs> so right now there are almost 4,500 active games on Real Mahjong. Yeah, Great. this has grown by leaps and bounds. Whoever's, they're doing a beautiful job, whoever has been creating these things. So I'm going to go into a new game and you just want me to go through a Charleston and sort of yeah. show yeah. you my decision making? Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Oh, that BF, that makes sense, that's your screen. Bubby BF, <laughs> I'm going to play it slow. I do invisible mode. And now this is the problem is I can't see the whole screen. I'm going to have to move. I think if you click on the top, you could kind of drag it. Yeah, I moved you guys away a little bit. Okay, yeah. so I'm going to resort these tiles. Okay, we're going to do this slow. Okay. Um, so do you what want to feed if anybody has questions? Like, does anybody anybody want to type in a question of, of what they would be thinking or why they would keep certain tiles? You know, you could chime in. Yeah, I won't be able to see the questions though. Right, we'll, oh, no, we'll read them to you. Okay, good. Yeah, let me see. Well, let me see other people's opinions before I tell you what I would do. All right, drum roll. <laughs> Any, anybody wanted to? To me, it jumps out. You, I mean, it looks like one three five, one three five seven. You know. Yep. That would be my Karen. first. Hey, Karen. It's Elisa. Hey, how are you? Listen, I teach Zoom, and I just want to let you know that if you where you're sharing your screen on the top, where it says View Options, if you double click on that, you'll see the chat, and you can pin the chat box to your screen so you can actually see everybody's questions. Uh, let's see. So wait, I go across the top. Go to the top. Your toolbar is on the top now because you you're yes. sharing your screen. Okay, and it says move chat. Over. So just double click on it. The box will open. And where does it say chat? Should say it when you pull it down. It's next oh, for more. Oh, for more. Yes, it's under more. Oh, yeah, I just did it. <laughs> Very cool. And then, and then another thing is, just so you know, if you can't see all the way on the right, there's an east and south. If you can't see those, you could actually click so you don't see the people's pictures. So there's yeah, I actually little, moved. It's like yeah. a little strip of pictures. I've actually yeah. been moving yeah. around. I, I, I closed that for now so I could see the whole, all of the tiles. Okay, great. Okay, so nobody's giving me much feedback. Sarah, what but do you yeah, I would say the 1357, I would hold on to all of my um, odds. 
Dr. Bam. All, all of the, Karen, well, Helen just said she would play odds. I agree. Yeah, you could lose the twos and the fours. Um, and then what are your takes on wins? Would you split them up? I wouldn't pass both of them for. Well, what I'd probably do in this situation is maybe four, eight, and, and east, or two, mm -hmm. four, and east, or something like that, but not the two and four in the same suit. So silly question, any reason you wouldn't do the south only because the Just wind in case, because south goes with odds. Oh, right. and that's funny. And I'm thinking defensively that you're giving them even, which goes with east. But yeah, I guess. But I'm getting rid of them. Yeah. So I don't need them, but I might. No, no, but I'm very saying minor chance that I would keep my, I, I probably won't need the South, but just in case that's the one I'd want to keep. Right. No, I, I get it. I, I was thinking defensively that you don't want to give them something that's good for their hands, but that well, makes of sense. Of course, of course, but it's so early on that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Okay. okay. Let's see if I say I'm giving away the four, the eight, and the East. I mean, we're just playing here. This is not yeah. serious. Uh, <laughs> Pass the tiles. How do I do the pass? Oh, it's under the chat thing. Yeah, you got to move the chat over. Can I move the chat? Okay, pass. Yeah, if you it. click on the top of it, it moves. Okay. Yeah. So now, what do we get? What do we get? Oh, good. We got some more odds. That's great. Oh, got a lot of odds. Okay, and I still see the bottom of the number line. Do we have a shot? We still don't have a shot at the 35. You know, that's in the back of my mind, too, is the 7 times 5 is 35. Mm -hmm. But we have no... I guess we have the five times three is 15, yeah. um, but we have no flowers, so that's kind of rough. But you notice we do have the north and the south now. Mm -hmm. So we are collecting the right kind of winds. Um, I hate to pass two of the same tile, but we don't need these twos. Right. Um, what would I, I would probably get rid of the three dot because it doesn't really go with anything. Mm -hmm. You know, it looks like my suits are one, three. It, ugh. Mm. What about what about keeping it just in case the one, three, five pan with the threes in the middle, maybe getting rid of the, the seven dot? Or you're keeping that for something else? And you know what? Um, yeah, the seven dot isn't really helping me either. You're right. I'm thinking even of that bottom hand, but that needs flowers too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Closed hand. Oh, the seven dot came back. Look at that. The no, south the single, came back. The singles and pairs one doesn't need it. Wow. Hmm? The singles and pairs one, three, five, seven, nine in the two suits doesn't need flowers. Right. She was talking about True. Yeah. But I don't have any nines. Yeah. Um, she doesn't have I don't the know ones. Those are going to start to turn up. No, that's so funny. I can't look at it this way. I need to sort it by. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're doing so much better in just the, just yeah. in the BAMs. We're doing so much better band. than in the other ones. We got the yep. one BAM. Yeah. Um, the north south would work with if we were doing um, pairs, but we don't and really have anything that's consistently. Keep or get rid of. It's like one, five, three, seven. Neither of those is working beautifully. I would say get rid of the three and the seven at this point. Mm -hmm. And eh, let's lose the one. Let's see what happens. Ah, and now, finally. <laughs> the nine shows up, but it's a little late. <sighs> this is what happens to me. I get winds and I don't. Yeah. Yeah, but as the winds are coming in, look, we've got better winds than anything else right now. <laughs> <Kind of three. laughs> I've got a sort of a second kind of hand coming right. in. Um, it and still looks like our best bet is going to be staying with the BAMs. Yeah. That's probably what I'm going to do. Um, Consecutive run. I mean, we've almost got, we've got a really good shot if we had the evens. Oh boy. I know. What are you going to pass at this point with all the winds? I know. You know what I might do? And we didn't call it real Mahjong ahead of time to give it, give us this nice challenging. <laughs> I know, you know, well, it's, it's what you do. Um, I might take a real long shot. Do the, the top singles and pairs? Um, yes. And hold on to the fives and the, uh, the threes, the fives, and the sevens. That's a, yeah, I, I like that. Mm. But then I still got to get rid of something, one of the wins. Right. Because I'm forced now, because it's an across, I got to pass something. Yeah. I definitely don't want to pass my fives. 
did I see any fours or sixes in the in the Charleston so far? I don't think no, because that's a problem. No. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just totally spitballing here. This is yeah, I don't think I'm gonna win this hand, whatever it turns into. It's fun. But it's hard. Let's just take a shot. And since I'm doing that, let's just see what happens. Ah, oh, now we got a lot of sevens. <laughs> That's funny. Um, seven, three. Wow. <laughs> just, just seeing what happens. Yeah. That's the harm. There's the nine came back and the one came back. Well, that's one thing for those of you that play against bots. I don't know if you notice that when you pass tiles on the first across, a lot of times the bot will give you back the tiles you threw them. I mean, you kind of can't rely on that because then, um, you know. Look at this with the winds. That doesn't happen. You're one away from having all the <laughs> crazy. Crazy, yeah. We just need a west and then we've got all of our pairs. But see, that's the, that's the other thing I was mentioning was if nobody else is doing the pair, is no, nobody else is doing the wins, why don't you pick them up? Right. You know? So that's sort of how that happened for us. And also, you said you don't end up playing the hand you thought you'd play. You didn't think you were going to do wins, and then. Yeah, and suddenly it's falling in, and now I've got a flower. So, <laughs> eh, you get the idea. Do we want to try another Charleston? Yeah, I think that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So, so we're, we're excited to let you all know that um, Karen and Donna and I were talking and this is gonna be, we, we think probably a monthly thing. And Karen, you, you were calling it um, Mahjong Makeover, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so either Mahjong Makeover or Charleston Challenge. And we feel that in a lot of our Zoom talks, a lot of the things people really are drawn to are upping their game. So we thought this was a great way to introduce the second lecture or discussion by Karen, but then also in the future, we're going to start really, this is something that's been in the works for a little while, really helping people just get out of their comfort zone and figure out what hands to go to and learn, you know, what to pick in the Charleston. So those will be announced on uh, Mahjong community and on uh, Modern Mahjong in our uh, events page. Thank right. You. And I think, I think the, the, the concept with the makeover is that we're going to try and find somebody to be our guinea pig. Yeah. who wants to be the person getting the makeover. <laughs> if anybody wants to volunteer or knows a new player, you can exactly. email us or you could text, uh, you could message us through Facebook. Right. So I'm just looking at this one. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm seeing the eights in all three suits. I'm seeing the thing that's coming to my mind is the seven, eight, nine in three different suits. Um, the consecutive runs the second hand down and consecutive runs in three suits. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So it would be like seven dots, eight bams, nine cracks. Let's just see what happens. That's sort of where my brain is going with it right now. So now one of the possibilities, we got more eight cracks. Um, like I said, I'm getting rid of things that don't go. I don't want to throw out my soap. So it's a question of do I pass the pair or do I pass the soap? Right. Um, part of what I'm thinking, I'm putting this over here for now, part of what I'm thinking is also that bottom consecutive run hand right. where it's like a stutter step. Yeah. It's a closed hand, but it's seven, eight, seven, eight, nine. Right. That might work. That's what I was thinking. Right. So in that sense, but these eights are just too pretty to, to give up on. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll just pass one because I don't want to pass a pair of twos. But yeah, seven, eight, seven, eight, nine is something that I'm thinking of. And I'm keeping these two and eight to the side because that'll pretty, probably be what I pass next. So seven, so eight, Karen, seven, eight, not, nine. not to confuse the issue, but how you have it set up now, is that how you normally set up your rack when you're playing in person? Yes, because I always, I would put it that way, even though it's not, I think, do they do BAMs, Cracks, Dots? Is that how they do it? Oh, no, I just meant like flowers, jokers, numbers, 
Oh dragons. yeah, I put the flowers to the left, I put the winds to the right, I put the, the uh, dragons to the right, the jokers to the left, um, and then within each suit. But then sometimes, you know, sometimes I'll switch it around right. as I'm playing. <laughs> you know, like five, six, seven or whatever. Well, someone was telling me that they played so much that they knew on Mahjong time if the person needed the tile that was thrown. And somebody who plays on Mahjong time will have to tell me if this makes sense but they could see where the tile would go to because it would go in order or it would go all the way to the end. Oh my God. So, <laughs> I mean, it's just like in real play, if you watch people right. put the tiles that you pass. Where they put them. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes when I'm playing with my friends, just to throw them off, I will stick a, a flower or whatever in the middle, or I'll stick a joker in the middle of something just so that it isn't that predictable. And what I, what I do is every time I get tiles, even if I don't need them at all, I stick them on my rack, move them around and then pass them. Cause I know oh. that one player is watching me. Just to pretend that you needed it or that I you were thinking it. We have one player who counts everything, knows exactly. Yeah, we have one of wow. them. So at what point, if you don't get the nine crack for the pair in the close, do you change your hand? I mean. Well, the, we're super early in the trial. Yeah, okay, so. So now I would do two different suits here. Um, oh boy, look at all these twos now. <laughs> Which is, well, I guess you're playing with bots. I was going to say, normally you don't really get twos this year. Twos are Yeah, really especially I've already got the soap, but I'm not letting myself be led astray by the soap for once. That's a, a miracle. <laughs> okay. We got seven, eight, nine. We got seven. Okay, so we got a couple things going on now. We've got six, seven, eight, nine is a very minor possibility. You know, the six, seven in the bam and the eight, nine in the dots. We've got a pair of sevens in both suits, which is interesting. Um, we could still do that fourth hand down in consecutive runs, seven, eight, nine with the with the soap, or either of the you know six, seven, eight with the pair in the middle. Right. In in bands for consecutive runs. So there's a bunch of little possibilities here. The seven eight the 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 seven eight seven eight nine is not really happening as far as I can tell. It's just not catching on. So I'm gonna <laughs> I don't have patience for it right now. And now watch me get a whole bunch of nine bam. Nine oh, yeah, definitely. Nope, it was a nine bam. Hmm. Now this brings up that weird hand where it's one six two sevens three eights four nines. You know what I'm talking about? It's the sixth consecutive run hand. Four flowers, six, a single six, two sevens, three eights, four nines. When the card first came out, that was every other win on this game. Yeah. Really? Oh, I, yeah. I, it was unbelievable how many times that would be the winning hand. And I think people kind of either got bored of it or whatever, but yeah, now I don't see it as much. Six. Hmm. Well, I don't have that many flowers to get excited about. Right. We need four flowers. And I don't have that many jokers. Six, seven, eight, nine is just the easiest doing six, seven in the bams and eight, nine in the dots. Mm -hmm. um, or so what I in might thought process now, are you thinking which, which tile do I just, like you said before, doesn't really fit? Like, right. I mean, what am I willing to give up at this point? I think I still have to keep my flower just to keep my options open for consecutive runs. Because obviously, if I just do six, seven, eight, nine in two suits, I don't need the flower. Right. But I still might go back to doing a different consecutive um, run hand. I'd hate to lose the flower if I end up needing it. You don't want to pass the flower at this point. No, absolutely. And at yeah. this point, um, this is an optional, you know, I can do a, a blind pass. So the question is, do I take that chance? Do I miss, do I miss I mean, making so for the tiles? So the seven dots that are there, I mean, what are you saving those for? That's what I'm saying is I hate okay. to pass a pair of them. Right, right. And you probably wouldn't get soaps at this point. Well, no, here's the other side of it though, is if I did the seven, eight, nine seven, eight, soap. Nine soap. Yeah, yeah, so that's the thing. What am I willing to part with? Right, here we are, right. I am actually going to go this way. I'm not going to go for that crazy one, two, three, four, because I'm not going to get enough flowers to make that happen. So I'm keeping open the six, seven, eight, nine, mm -hmm. or the seven, eight, nine seven, soap, eight, nine. or the seven, eight, nine with the flowers. Got it. So let's see what happens. 
That's good. I got another eight. Hmm. So six, seven, eight, nine is a little bit better now because I can use the joker to complete the six and then call for the seven. I can call for the eight. The nine is a problem. Right. Okay, I'm going to throw my soap. No, I'm not going to throw my soap because I may end up needing it. Yeah. Very, very slight chance for the one dot. Yeah. So, we'll never know what happened. Okay, <laughs> okay no, that was the way, you know, you're just looking at what comes in that you weren't expecting. Like, we didn't know that we were going to collect so many wins in that first time. Yeah. But often, I feel like when I was teaching my husband, uh, he wanted to pick a hand and he loved the consecutive section. So that's what he would focus in on. And he, he didn't understand why every time I got three new tiles, I was readjusting and looking back at the card. And I said, cause it changed now. And I would point yeah. to different things. And I said, you, you have to kind of incorporate the new tiles. You know, it, it just definitely keeps you, I mean, you probably changed four different hands while during that, you know, Charleston. Right. There is a blog article that talks about I literally changed a hand four times in playing, not during the Charleston, during the playing, because sometimes you have to. And it happened a lot quicker than this one did because we're like verbally, right. you know, we're verbalizing what's going on in our brains. Um, if I was playing, I would have been just doing it. I wouldn't have been making, you know, rationalizations of what I was doing. I would just do it. I wouldn't have to explain it. But yeah, you, the bottom line for me is what catches my eye, what looks like it's going to be fun to play. You know, I try not to do the same old boring hand every time. This is another boobyism. Life is too short to play boring hands. <laughs> One thing in a tournament to try and just win and win quick. But if I have two jokers, like I think one of those times I had a joker, the other time I didn't. If I have two jokers, it's a lot of fun to think of what are the possibilities. It just opens up so many other options for you that it's like, yeah, why don't I try for that? You know, so. So how has um, this coronavirus affected you? I mean, you're not teaching, right? I mean, you're playing online. Not traveling. Not traveling. Hmm. Not seeing well, I, heard, my I heard a, a, a comment today that made me think of Donna. Um, you know how you love to, you know, after a few months you need to travel? The word was travitude. So instead of attitude, it's travitude. It's the feeling you get when you haven't traveled in a while <laughs> and you need to travel. Yeah, I get in a bad mood if I don't do go somewhere every few months. And so I'm in a bad mood. <laughs> so uh, are you writing anything? You're keeping up with your blog though, right? And I, I wrote a blog article the other day. Um, I haven't been writing as much. I'm hoping to do another book, but right. some of that depends on November. And other than that, you know, I'm, I'm pretty focused on something that's going to happen about six weeks from now. That's sort of where my mind is a lot when I'm not playing Mahjong. Got it. So, that's what that is. So Understood. So um, we're opening up. Um, if anybody wants to just, if they don't feel like talking, they can put it in the chat box. Or if they want, they could just click on their unmute or they could text that they want us to unmute them. Yeah. But this was great. It was just such a nice way to be interactive. Thank you, Helen. We thought it was fun too. Um, we know that if anybody would like to email us and let us know that they want to be the Mahjong makeover guinea pig, I feel like it's the Today Show makeover. You know, right. when they <laughs> how does that work? <laughs> One of the girls we played Mahjong with did the did the Today Show makeover. Yep. Yep. She was picked, and yeah, wow. she didn't get to keep the clothes though. So. Aww. Oh, wow. that's funny. I forgot. <laughs> Um, and we also have a show and tell coming up um, in October. Why do I so know? So that's been great. We've had a few emails with some beautiful sets, some unique um, travel sets, some interesting, you know, favorite sentimental sets. So the best way to be involved in it is you could attend, but also if you email modernmajan at gmail.com, which is in the chat, you could email us um, a picture of the set you'd like to share or if you want to email us a short video of a sentimental set, a favorite set, one of your first vintage sets, whatever you'd like to share and some information about it. And Donna and I are going to share it on the screen and just have a little talk about all the different amazing sets that there are out there and how they mean interesting things to all of us.
Absolutely. So, great idea. Yeah, we just find people yeah. missing the tiles, you know, they're yeah. missing the beauty <laughs> of the tiles. So we're going to try and share some of ours and some other people's. So that's how. So, yes, that is the antidote, Greg. We agree. <laughs> so, thank you, Karen, so much. We really appreciated this. We appreciate all of you attending and sticking with us for this whole hour. Right. I hope somebody oh. will volunteer to be our guinea pig. That'd be fun. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. And then we'll trade off seeing, you know, other Charleston Challenge and Makeover. We'll see how the schedule works for everybody. Mm -hmm. But so, thank you. If anybody has any um, questions for Karen, her email is at the top of the chat. Um, but it is Bubby Fisher, and that's spelled F I S C H E R mm -hmm. at gmail.com. And her blog post is, her blog is on there too. It's Bubby, B U B B E M J dot blogspot.com. Mm -hmm. So that's where you could get in contact with her. You could find her books by emailing her. And I think we just got a few new messages come in. Um, oh, Helen agrees. And thank you, Kathleen. Mm -hmm. So thank you all for your kind words. Thank you for keeping up with us each. Yeah, thanks for thanks for turning out. I mean, it's what is yeah. it Wednesday night? Yeah. We, I only know. Wait, no, my husband knows it's Wednesday when my hair is blow. <laughs> ah. <laughs> and I actually have a little bit of makeup on. Otherwise, it is quarantine mode with sweatpants and yoga pants all week. So yeah, this is the one good thing that it gets me at least once a week to you know I shower every day, but at least to you know. <laughs> remember what it's like to get dressed so well thank you all have a great have a week great everyone week, we'll see you in two weeks i won't be on your zoom thing i have a tournament that night oh. so she was busy so good for you i have like one tournament coming up in october that i'm going to be on okay. including well, you bye <laughs> ladies thank you bye. for another thank great you. evening bye, bye karen bye.